Good morning, everyone, and, and thanks for joining us. Uh, I do want to begin by briefly mentioning the devastating impact of Hurricane Ian in Florida and extend my deepest sympathies on behalf of Australia to all those who've been affected in the Florida Peninsula, the Cayman Islands and Cuba. The images of the destruction and suffering has sent a shock of grief and sympathy right around the world. Australia has stood together with the US in times of natural disaster. And of course, Australians would well remember those US firefighters who lost their lives uh, during the bushfire crisis here in Australia of 2019-2020. Uh, I've indicated to our friends in the United States that Australia remains as always uh, prepared to provide any assistance and support uh, that we can at this difficult time. So we stand with uh, the United States as always. Uh, today, uh, we have had a very successful uh, meeting of the National Cabinet, and I thank uh, the colleagues uh, for uh, the goodwill that they bring uh, to these discussions. Uh, one of the things that I have been determined to do as the Prime Minister is to get more national consistency with outcomes. Uh, so that the Australian people can have more certainty and less confusion going forward. And I thank the premiers and chief ministers for the spirit in which they've undertaken discussions both around the cabinet table today, but also last evening and in the lead up to uh, these, uh, this, this meeting as well. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we uh, have measures which are proportionate and that are targeted at the most vulnerable. We want to continue to promote vaccinations as being absolutely critical, including people getting booster shots. And we want a policy that promotes resilience and capacity building and reduces a reliance on government intervention. We have agreed uh, today that we will end, uh, states and territories will end their respective mandatory isolation requirements on the 14th of October. Uh, the pandemic leave disaster payments will end at that time as well, with the exception of uh, people in high risk settings, uh, which uh, need to be uh, given particular support. So aged care, health care, uh, the measures, uh, disability care, uh, the areas that have been previously identified. Uh, can I thank uh, Professor Kelly uh, for uh, his report uh, to today's meeting and for uh, correspondence that, that will circulate to you, uh, the advice uh, that we received. And I'd ask uh, Professor Kelly uh, to make some comments and then uh, we are happy to, all of us, take some questions. Professor Kelly. Um, thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, so yesterday, the Prime Minister did ask me for some specific med medical advice um, in relation to this proposal to remove the isolation period uh, as it currently stands. And so I provided him with, a, uh, with that correspondence and that will be uh, circulated as the Prime Minister has said. Uh, I'd like to stress that this is a context specific and time in specific um, set of recommendations. Uh, it recognises that we are in a very low transmission, community transmission uh, phase of the pandemic here in Australia. It does not in any way suggest that the pandemic is finished. Uh, we will almost certainly see uh, future peaks of the virus um, uh, into the future as we have seen uh, earlier in this year. However, at the moment, we have very low rates of, of uh, both cases, hospitalisations, uh, intensive care, uh, admissions, aged care outbreaks and various other measures that we've been uh, following very closely in our weekly um, uh, open report. Um, we also have at the moment very high hybrid immunity from previous infection as well as high vaccination rates 
particularly and specifically in those highly vulnerable communities, older people, uh, people in aged care in particular, disabled uh, people living with a disability uh, and, and the ones that we've talked about many times before. Um, it's a time though now to consider that we have other, uh, uh, other things that we can do uh, to protect those most vulnerable people and that is absolutely our key aim. Uh, isolation itself cannot be seen in isolation. Uh, it needs to be seen in the context of that high vaccination rate, high previous infection uh, giving further protection, the availability of treatments, the availability of vaccines, including the, the new uh, bivalent vaccines, uh, and all of the other measures we have in place, particularly to protect vulnerable people close to where they are. It's time to move away from COVID exceptionalism, in my view, uh, and we should be thinking about what we do to protect people from any respiratory disease. It does not mean that we have somehow magically changed the infectiousness of this virus. It is still infectious, but in the context we are in at the moment in Australia, and this is an important epidemiological point, uh, we can't just look at isolation by itself. And we need to look at all of those measures and the protection we have, as well as other protections. Important that we keep an option uh, for a change to these settings in the future. Uh, and that's the work that National Cabinet has, has requested of us to do. Uh, to keep that, uh, that vigilance for new variants, for example, uh, for changes in the epidemiological situation in Australia, uh, for signs that we uh, have strain on our healthcare system and be prepared to make different decisions at that moment. Uh, but at, for now, uh, as I've stated in the letter, uh, I believe that removing the isolation period at this time is a reasonable course of action from the public health point of view. Thanks very much, Professor. Uh, Michelle. Ask uh, Dr Kelly, did this go to the uh, Health Advisory Committee and was there a consensus if it did? We haven't specifically discussed this matter. I was asked for this advice yesterday and I provided it as the Chief Medical Officer to the Prime Minister. Gone to the AHPPC before it went to National Cabinet today and is it a pro you know, should we describe today's decision as a a unanimous decision by National Cabinet, or is it better to describe it as a consensus decision? It was a unanimous decision by the National Cabinet today and had the support of all Premiers and Chief Ministers. Yes, so, um, to Professor Kelly again, um, could you talk us through what impact you think this change would have on cases, hospitalisations, deaths? Um, and you mentioned right at the end of your comments about potentially changes to settings in future. Could you see a moment where you would recommend bringing back um, mandatory isolation, potentially, you know, another peak period like next winter. So, what what I can say about the effect of, effect of this that remains to be seen, and we'll continue to be looking closely at that. What I can say is that from the peak that we had, and you'll remember press conferences at that time, our concern about uh, the healthcare system in particular around the end of July, early August. Uh, at that time, we had over 1,200 um, aged care facilities with outbreaks thousands of, of cases within aged care, hundreds of cases uh, amongst healthcare, uh, aged care work, workers. As of yesterday, we have 200, um, just over 200 aged care outbreaks, less than 1,000 aged care residents with COVID and 314 staff. Things have changed a lot um, since, since that, that time. And that has included a month where we uh, decreased from seven days to five days, not in aged care, but, but in the broader community. Aged care is a really helpful way of looking at, at, at and, and monitoring this situation uh, going forward because of the, of the close attention we're make, giving to that particularly vulnerable setting, and we'll continue to do that. And your second question was, sorry. Do you see a moment where you could recommend, in, as, a, as a health, you know, health, uh, health recommendations that you would recommend bringing back mandatory isolation? Like you, your, your comments that at the start seem to be very much emphasising we're in a low risk setting, low community transmission setting. If we go to back to a high risk, high transmission setting, what would be your advice? Yeah, so we, we've been tasked to come back with that advice. Um, we, we are, and, and this comes back to the discussion about AHPPC, they have been very much involved with our, our um, charting out of a community protection framework uh, for this next phase, this non-emergency phase of the pandemic response. And other parts of of, of the government have been looking at, uh, and the health department more broadly, at a transition approach. So that would fit into that, um, and I'll, we'll, have, we'll provide that uh, advice uh, in due course. Here. 
So if uh, quarantine requirements were reintroduced in future based on advice, uh, would the pandemic leave payment also be reintroduced at that point? Well, uh, what, what we agreed at previous meetings was that where government was mandating particular requirements, that is that people couldn't get access to their income, then with that mandating comes a responsibility to provide support. Uh, but uh, we have uh, uh, agreed today, based upon the advice, that we are moving beyond the emergency settings that will put in place. It isn't sustainable for government to pay people's wages forever. It was always envisaged that these measures were emergency measures that were put in place. And what we've done today is take the advice from the chief medical officer, uh, listen to that advice, and, uh, and, and therefore change the settings so that they're proportionate. Uh, I believe that uh, we should always act in a proportionate way uh, and that now is the right time uh, for this to occur, this change, and that got the unanimous agreement of uh, states and territories today. Bill? You go first. Oh, <laughs> Prime Minister, um, you've also agreed, I understand, to work further on policy options for patient pathways and reducing pressure on hospitals. Um, I see that that's going to be considered in the context of each jurisdiction's budget. Does that mean um, hospital funding, you're looking at eight separate deals instead of uh, uh, continuing the national 50-50 funding agreements? Uh, look, we'll continue to discuss uh, health care as long as the Commonwealth and states exist, frankly. Um, th that's just a reality of the system which is there. But one of the things that we've agreed, uh, and we've made this point before, is that it isn't just about a dollar amount. Part of the pressure that's there on emergency departments is uh, people who should not be going to hospitals, but are going because there isn't primary health care available, because people in nursing homes don't have access to health care. So someone who uh, is an aged care resident who could have been assisted by having a nurse in a nursing home as identified by the Aged Care Royal Commission ends up in the emergency department because the health concerns become acute rather than are dealt with in a timely manner. Uh, there are people with uh, disabilities who end up in emergency departments and in hospitals as well. And we'll continue to work on ways in which we can get better health outcomes. From my perspective, it's never been about uh, the dollars. It's been about making sure that we get good health outcomes in the interests of the population. And the First Secretary's group and others are continuing uh, to work on that and we'll continue to have more to say in the future, including at the December meeting of the National Cabinet. Prime Could I ask just on another topic I understand was discussed? Sure. Can we deal with this? For well, just Senator National Cameron. Cabinet first. Oh, OK, okay. sure. It came up last night. Sure. Premier Palaszczuk, so it's been reported in the last hour you've, you've rescinded your land tax proposal. Uh, following discussions with colleagues yeah. last night. We, yeah. uh, could you elaborate on that? And we, are you a little disappointed you didn't get support? Or, no, 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 because or? it actually came out of um, the Treasurer's meeting. So there were discussions held at that forum and it does rely on the goodwill of other states. And contrary to what the public report, Dom and I actually get along quite well. Very well. Even though we win the state of origin. Um, but in terms of, you know, it does require the goodwill of other states. And um, if we can't get those um, additional information, um, I will put that aside. Tom, what's your I'm answer? Answer. Um, in terms of, can I just first clarify that the, in terms of the mandatory isolation um, lifting, that applies to people in high risk settings as well. And in terms of lifting the payment, what's the incentive then for a casual worker to stay at home when they're sick if they risk not getting any money um, if they stay home? Uh, people, one of... Uh, 
the, the statements that Professor Kelly has used uh, here th today that was used also this morning was moving away from COVID exceptionalism. Uh, the flu has existed and health issues have existed for a long period of time and uh, the government hasn't always stepped in to pay people's wages while people have health concerns. It's not sustainable to have in place a system whereby the government steps in permanently and uh, we understand the pressures that are there. It's one of the reasons why my government has focused as well on reducing the incidence of casual work and on upping uh, the, uh, the priority for my government is on creating uh, permanent work, permanent employment. It's one of the risks that's there with the increased casualisation of the workforce that we've seen. So just a Prime question Minister, of the, the Chief um, Health Officer. Um, sure. uh, you've just said that the pandemic isn't over and the Health Minister said a very similar thing earlier this week, but doesn't uh, removing these restrictions send a very different message to the Australian public that maybe it is time to relax and the pandemic is coming to an end? So I, I think the crucial point there is uh, that the emergency response phase is probably finished um, at this point in the pandemic. The key thing is that we will see more waves. This, this virus will be around for many years, um, but it's a time to kind of is to consider, as the PM has just said, different ways of, of dealing with it, and that should be proportionate to what's happening in front of us. Whatever, whatever we are doing needs to be evidence-based that it is working, and it needs to be equitable. And all of those things are particularly related to protecting people at most risk of severe disease. So these are all changes in the way we're dealing with the pandemic and it explains the decisions of today. Uh, here, 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 well, here in the front, then Mark, then Greg, then Pablo, and I think we might be done. And for the people behind me, if you want to jump in, feel free to uh, <laughs> jump in at any time too. Uh, thanks, Prime yeah, Minister. Just a question about, um, do National Cabinet give any consideration to uh, vaccine mandates uh, for those healthcare workers who uh, still have to be vaccinated and will they be removed as well? Uh, vaccines uh, uh, mandates have been in place for a long period of time in aged care, for example, the flu vaccines. Um, there have been requirements as part of occupational health and safety issues for a long period of time. Mark? Prime Minister, possibly yeah. for Professor yeah. Kelly, um, the one thing that isolation periods gave people was certainty about how long they should stay away from work if they're crook. Now, do they stay away for five days, seven days, three days, one day? How long? So it, it's covered in the, in the letter, that specific issue. And as I said at the beginning, we haven't changed the infectiousness of this virus. It remains infectious. The infectious period we know, it's, it's the, the, the average is two to three days is the, is the peak infectiousness. Um, so that's one level. Uh, again, it would be if anyone has symptoms, they would more likely be infectious. Uh, we're not stopping infectious people going out into the community now, um, and, and we won't be in the future. Um, the important thing is within the context of where we are now with high vaccination rates, high hybrid immunity and so forth, as well as the availability of treatments, uh, it's a different way of dealing with it. Um, in terms of the occupational ele elements, I think in those, particularly in those high risk settings, that will remain a discussion with, with employers. Uh, work health and safety elements apply for all sorts of infectious diseases. COVID should be seen like that. Greg. On the uh, health uh, funding deal, is a 50% um, Commonwealth contributions, is that on the table on an ongoing basis? And, and can the state and territory leaders um, tell us what they would like from the next funding deal? Well, I can tell you that what they would like is more money. Okay. Why, 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 why stop at 50? Anyone here want 80? Yep. Um, you know, that, it, it's an ongoing debate which is there, uh, I've stated very clearly my view, and, and I must say there is, regardless of the debate about numbers, there is a consensus view, I think it's fair to say, that what we need to do is to take pressure off the hospital systems, and there is a range of ways that you can do that. I've identified in a previous answer uh, some of uh, the ways in terms of people with disabilities, people 
who don't have access to primary care, they can't get access to a GP, so they end up at the local centre. Now, we will have a range of measures in place at the budget in October that include the funding for urgent care clinics. Urgent care clinics are aimed at uh, taking pressure off emergency departments. It was a very specific commitment uh, that we gave uh, to make them, uh, they will provide for bulk billing services so that if little Johnny or little Mary breaks her arm, she's not waiting in a queue at uh, RPA or other hospitals around the country for six to eight hours to get access whilst they keep getting bumped further down the queue because people uh, with more acute health issues are having to be dealt with. Uh, we need uh, to look at uh, these issues as an entire health system. And I must say uh, that the discussion uh, that we have had in the time that I've been Prime Minister uh, is much more, much less tabloid, if I can put it that way, uh, about uh, the level of the discussion and, and we'll continue to talk those issues through. Pablo and then... Prime Minister, on yep. the Optus data leak, has yep. Optus responded to your calls uh, for them to pay for the replacement of passports for, for those people who have been implicated? And the AFP has also launched an investigation and is assisting in protecting around 10,000 people. Should Optus pay for that as well? Uh, the, the AFP are currently, I think, while I'm speaking, holding a press conference, so I'm not going to comment uh, and... Uh, while the AFP are uh, having that, I'll, I'll leave them uh, to comment on the actions that they've taken, except to say that I support the AFP in the response uh, that they've undertaken. Um, Optus have responded uh, to uh, my request uh, that I made both in the parliament uh, and that uh, Senator Wong made in writing to Optus. They will cover the costs of replacing affected customers' passports. I think that's entirely appropriate. I find it extraordinary that the federal opposition called upon taxpayers uh, to foot the bill. And I note uh, Paul Fletcher's comments this morning uh, that uh, attempted to play politics with this issue and somehow blame uh, the government, him having sat in a cabinet for nine years and uh, his failure to provide any criticism on a serious level of Optus, uh, I leave Mr Fletcher to explain why that was the case. So just on your comments about um, treating COVID like we would a flu or, or, or any other, other kind of virus, um, it's pretty clear that COVID does have long-term implications for some people who do get it. Um, so number one, what are you doing to help people who might have those more long-term issues with COVID infections? And then for Professor Kelly, um, are you expecting increases or an impact on, on the general population by having COVID more freely spreading? And how will that work with, with people getting long COVID? Well, what I've spoken about isn't uh, that, uh, you know, I'm not a, a doctor or an epidemiologist. I'll leave that to Professor Kelly. What I would say though, as public decision makers, uh, we have a responsibility to listen to the health advice, but we also have a responsibility uh, to make decisions which are proportionate. Uh, that is what uh, we have done. Uh, COVID is still uh, out there. We understand that. Uh, we talked about the need to continue to run campaigns to get people vaccinated. Uh, we continue to provide support in high risk areas. We'll continue to monitor these issues and we'll have another discussion in December. Uh, but as Professor Kelly has said, uh, we are making these decisions based upon the circumstances which we're in right now, just as uh, over the winter period, where we had a combination of an increase in COVID infections with a severe flu season as well, that had a combined impact on the health system that required a continuation of emergency measures. Over a period of time, the nature of emergency measures is that they're not there uh, with no end date in, in sight. And it would not be responsible to do so because if this was a uh, 
uh, a media conference uh, a year ago, uh, a whole range of things would have been different. Your actions as an individual journalist and as human beings out there when you walk around the street are different. People are responding differently. I was at the MCG last week with just over 100,000 people. That was not happening. Borders were closed. We are changing our position based upon changing advice and changing circumstances. And that has to occur. There's not a role for government in running every bit of people's lives forever. And that is my firm position. You know, this isn't an ideological thing. This is a practical outcome uh, that was agreed across the board. And I'll give the last word to Professor Kelly. Uh, thanks, PM. So on, on the long COVID situation, Australia is in quite a different situation to most of the rest of the world. Because of the, um, uh, the measures that we, and the decisions we took in 2020 and 2021, uh, very few people, um, I'm aware that the Victorian Premier is next to me and they had a different, uh, a different experience, particularly in Melbourne in 2020 uh, and in New South Wales in 2021. But for the majority of Australians, we, did not, we were not exposed to COVID before we had had at least two vaccines. Um, we know the, the major risk factors for long COVID are um, having had infection before vaccination, being unvaccinated, um, having severe illness and having other types of, of, of COVID that were not Omicron. None of those things pertain to the Australian situation for most of us. We, we're looking very closely and we've been tasked by Health Minister Butler to come with a national plan about, about COVID. We're doing some very um, in-depth data work uh, with Victoria at the moment, um, with the Commonwealth, which, is, uh, which will yield interesting results and give more of an, an indication of what's happening. But so far, when we've started to look at, 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 uh, at every uh, data, piece of data that we have in, in the Commonwealth, uh, we're not seeing a major picture of long COVID. Recognise that people, there are people out there with long-term symptoms, uh, but it remains to be seen how, how that will play out in the Australian uh, situation and the parliamentary committee that's also been formed will, will, will help uh, in that regard. But there'll be more to say that, about that in coming weeks. Thanks very much.